Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Aaron Newcomb joins me. We're going to be talking about Maglix, a way to greatly scale your Kubernetes workloads. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Aaron Newcomb. Episode 520, recorded March 6th, 2019, Magalix. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by IT Pro TV, providing effective training with access to virtual labs and practice tests. Visit go.itpro.tv slash floss to take advantage of their lowest prices of the season. For an additional 30% off for the lifetime of your active subscription, use code FLOSS30 at checkout. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free Libre open source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at Stonehenge.com, bringing you each week the movers, the shakers, the big projects, little projects, projects you may be using every day and not aware of it, projects you might want to download right after this show and play with, but not while you're in your car. Be sure you get home first. All right, so if you're listening to this in your car, this is not a time to be downloading things, okay? Well, maybe if you're in the back of the car, I guess, if you're not driving. It's probably fun. Joining me once again is my lovely and talented co-host, Aaron Newcomb. Aaron, welcome back to the show. Hey, Randall. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. You have different surroundings than we normally see you in. What's what's the deal? I know. Isn't it great? I was able to come up to uh, Petaluma because I've got a, I've got a work gig uh, over in Sonoma. So uh, I was like, hey, you know, I can just like take a little detour, go up to Petaluma, and then go over to work. Uh, so I was mm-hmm. able to come into the studio for once. It's nice to be back. I, I used to come in all the time for this show uh, just to be in studio and then, you know, work and life get in the way. <laughs> and I haven't actually done the show from there in, I gotta, it's gotta be seven years now. It's been a while. It's definitely really? been a while. It's been that long? Yeah. Yeah. Well, remember we had, um, you and I were in studio with, um, the guy that was doing, um, zero MQ. I oh think yeah. Was yeah. Yeah. Project. Yeah. I think it's the last time I was there, actually, wow. way back then. No, no, I did the uh, New Year's Eve show. I think it was like five years ago. So it was, it's, it's a, no, but I bet that's been longer than five years, too. Time just flies and you're having fun. Yeah, it's still uh, a long I, time. I am on Wi-Fi uh, in uh, a, a hotel in Petaluma. No, not Petaluma. Where, where am I at? Pasadena. Starts with a P. <laughs> has a lot of the same letters, but it's not the same place. I am here this week for uh, SCALE, the Southern California Linux Expo. And so I came in a couple days early so I could work with my buddy, uh, Captain Neil, who produces uh, InsightCruises.com. And we've been uh, working together to uh, help his website get better and also do some more code for him. Uh, I'm having to do a combination of things I have to do. SQL, I have to do um, Perl, I have to do uh, occasionally CSS. It's like, oh, it's not really my area, but sure enough, it's, it's all working out well. So um, uh, that's why there's this sort of somewhat messy bed behind me, and I'm uh, checking out this morning uh, after we get done with the show. Uh, anyway, that's enough of that. Um, so we're going to talk today about Magalix. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Mag- Magalix? Yeah, pretty good. Which is basically a Kubernetes smart manager. Kubernetes, of course, is a big thing now. People are moving to containers, moving to scaling with Kubernetes, moving to um, being able to build uh, apps that can, uh, you know, different parts of the apps can can scale up. Uh, my primary client right now is ZipRecruiter, which I'll, I'll be at their headquarters next week. Um, is working to move everything so that instead of having this monolithic image that everybody, uh, in, in order to scale, you basically get a whole new machine in EC2 or whatever, uh, they're actually moving it so that everything is individual parts so that as the load uh, rises for a particular aspect of the application, uh, uh, the Kubernetes can can scale that. And Magalix today is uh, the, the project... Uh, it seems to be the, a project that can sort of monitor that and do the right thing in terms of scaling and stuff. And uh, I met today's uh, guest, uh, which I didn't put the name anywhere anywhere handy. Uh, <laughs> scroll, scroll, baby, scroll. All right, hold on. Mohammed. Yes, Mohammed. Right, right. <laughs> Mohammed, Mohammed. Right. Um, so um, uh, I met Mohammed uh, at the. Uh, uh, I kept calling it. Kubicon, because it's sort of like in Kubicon did a stately dome decree, right? Uh, but it's KubeCon. It was KubeCon last uh, last uh, December up in Seattle, and uh, I had a great time chatting with him. And he said, "Well, I'll put um, why not come on the show and talk about that." So 
Uh, that's how it's going to be today. We're going to actually bring him on in just a few minutes. Uh, but before that, anything you want else to want to add, Aaron? No, I mean, this is exciting stuff and very timely as well. So there's, um, I, I would just say that there seems to be a, uh, I deal with this all the time at work, obviously. Um, yeah. And, you know, there seems to be a, uh, um, a, a two, two opinions on, on this, which is one is, wouldn't it be great if we could just get rid of all of this background stuff, right, and do it automatically? Mm -hmm. um, and, and then there's another opinion that says, oh, well, we can't get rid of all of it because we still need to get insights from the infrastructure, i.e. Kubernetes, containers, et cetera, um, that's, that's kind of powering our development efforts and so forth. So we, there needs to be like some middle ground where wouldn't it be great if we could automate um, all, of, all of the infrastructure that we're rolling out with containers, um, but still have enough control that we can see when something goes wrong. And so it seems like that's where uh, Megalix, if I'm saying that right. Um, <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> Megalix, Megalix. Uh, yeah, we'll Megalix, find out in a minute. It seems like that's like where that, they're yes. playing is, hey, we're going to automate this and hopefully, you know, enable you to uh, scale up your, your applications faster and hopefully pr provide more performance when you need it. So I'm really curious to see how they get about that and how do they know exactly when to scale, right? What are those pointers that, um, that they're taking in to know, okay, we need to roll out more containers for this application um, so that you don't over provision as well because that's a problem when you get your bill from AWS you're like whoa is this so big and it's like oh well we spun up a lot of containers or instances um, right. that we didn't need or at the end of the day or we had we had over provision so anyway that's my thoughts going into this and I also want to apologize to the audience I've got I've been fighting a head cold and a chest cold for the last couple of days so my throat's probably a little more scratchier than it normally is and I mean you may actually hear me coughing a couple of times but um, I'm here to do the show so that's how it's going to work but before we start the show before we bring him on let's go ahead and talk about a very important topic because this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by IT Pro TV experienced IT professionals who deliver comprehensive training at the click of your mouse Spring is almost here, and there has never been a better time than now to take advantage of their lowest prices ever. Purchase a standard membership, video only, for $28.50 a month. Upgrade to a premium membership, video plus labs and practice tests, for $42 a month. But wait, you can save even more. IT Pro TV is still honoring our special offer, 30% off for all TWIT listeners. Dropping the standard membership to only $19.95 a month or $199 a year, and the premium to $29.50 a month or $295 a year. Stream IT Pro TV's courses live and on demand worldwide. Chromecast, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, PC, or their iOS and Android apps. New content is added daily, so your training is always aligned with the latest certifications and the most current exams. IT Pro TV is CompTIA's official video training partner. 12 CompTIA on demand courses CompTIA A, Network Plus, and Security Plus certs. Visit go.itpro.tv slash floss to get started with your standard or premium membership today. Don't let another season pass you by without earning your IT certifications. That's go.itpro.tv slash F-L-O-S-S -S and use the code FLOSS30 for an additional 30% off for the lifetime of your active subscription. IT Pro TV, flexible training, binge-worthy content, life-changing results. And we thank IT Pro TV for their sponsorship of FLOSS Weekly. And now let's go ahead and bring on our guest. Mohammed. welcome to the show. Hi. Great to be with Hi, you. And where, are you and where are you speaking to us from? Uh, I'm now speaking from Cairo. Uh, we are based in Seattle, but I'm just uh, visiting Cairo these days. Cool, cool. And uh, so, how, how close did we get in trying to describe what Megalix is about? Why don't you Why don't you give us a thirty thousand foot view? What What problem are you solving with Megalix? First of all, you pronounce it right. It's Megalix. <laughs> oh, good. Okay, um, good. I got that one. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that's a, and and actually, also, you got it right in terms of what we're trying to do. Um, uh, we are basically building a low-touch uh, continuous optimization for Kubernetes uh, that will allow developers and teams to realize the savings 10x faster and save up to 50% of their cloud bill. Uh, and we use uh, machine learning to achieve all of that. This is what we do in a nutshell. Uh, tell me about machine learning. How is that, how is that impacting this? So uh, machine learning is, is engaged at different levels. Um, 
the first uh, the first one is rather than uh, doing reactive uh, kind of uh, scalability for the infrastructure and containers, we try to do it in a proactive way. So if you're running your application, um, you know, in a fairly stable environment, and you know that there is a weekly or maybe uh, or maybe daily pattern of your usage, you want to your infrastructure and capacity go with that. So the same. In the morning, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m., you get a spike, and then the rest of the day, maybe things get uh, a bit slower. Um, you want to make sure that you have the right infrastructure or the right capacity during those two hours, and you don't want the, to keep that infrastructure provision for the for the rest of the day. Uh, you can wind down parts of it and make sure that uh, you know moving forward, you're you're efficient all the time. So. Being proactive on that and learning the pattern is the first part uh, where the machine learning um, piece get engaged. The second part is when you, uh, when when basically um, the the system tries to understand uh, the correlations between different metrics. So if I scale mm-hmm. container number one, and that container you know um, is going to keep up, do I need to, to keep up with those uh, you know users workloads? Do you really need to scale up other containers in the background or not? So rather than for the developer or the DevOps guy to add all the rules, all the complex rules around you know each one of those containers uh, independently, and then the, they need they would need to really go through them every few weeks. Those rules are generated automatically, and the dependencies are identified using machine learning. Um, so that's uh, that's the second part, and then the last part. You know, think of it again as the as as the autopilot. If if the uh, if the AI made a recommendation or decision that is not really right uh, for that particular workload, how can the AI or how can that scalability really roll back and give control back to the to the humans or you know to the uh, to the users? A nice analogy that we usually uh, give it is. Think of Magalix as uh, as the autopilot. Pretty much use that that analogy, uh, and uh, you know that that kind of an example. The the commercial flights they would have the uh, the autopilot, and it's for sure the human pilots can take the whole trip end to end by themselves. But the reason that they uh, that they use the autopilot because there are so many variables uh, that they need to take care of during that long flight. And at a certain point, the human pilot does not really need to take care of or, or keep monitoring all of these. So the autopilot can take care of you know, the simple stuff uh, and reduce the cognitive overhead from, um, you know, uh, from whoever you know, driving the, the, the plane or flying the, the plane at that time. So we're doing the same thing for cloud infrastructure. We, we want to basically uh, make it easy uh, to, uh, to scale up and down the infrastructure based on parameters that are coming from or starting from the user workloads all the way to the infrastructure. And, and so how did this get started? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll share with you our story. Um, so I, I worked I worked at AWS, I worked at Azure, and, and I really enjoyed, um, you know, working with, you know, with, with such gigantic infrastructure at both companies. And Four years ago, I moved into a company called Climate Corporation. Uh, it's in digital agriculture, and uh, I was responsible for uh, all their cloud infrastructure. They were one of the largest customers at AWS. And frankly, when I moved at that side of the fence, at the other side of the fence, I saw the uh, the dark side of the cloud um, adoption, if you will. Uh, first day in the job, my manager asked me two questions. Are we efficient? Are we moving fast? Uh, went back again to him after 24 hours, the answer was no, and no, we're not efficient, we're not really uh, getting the best return on investment. So we've mm-hmm. kick-started a, a six-month project, and we said, okay, uh, we want to really make sure that we are, um, we're making a good job in terms of how much uh, value we're getting out of our infrastructure. We did, uh, you know, we did our homework, you know, through uh, looking at matrix, looking at our, at our spending, we winded down big parts of our infrastructure, at the end of the six month, we really celebrated. Everything was great, and I was ready to take my bonus. Four weeks after that, um, we just regressed back, and um, you know, we scratched our head. What, 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 and we kept asking ourselves, "What really happened there?" And it was a very simple for us, a very simple reason. Um, our developers just release a new version of our software. They want to make sure that they're really having the the right amount of infrastructure and ready for that new release. So they simply over provisioned. Um, so 
we went back again to the whiteboard, optimized again, and then uh, in three months, we went back to the green but we regressed back. So we were going through different cycles of you know, success, failure, success, failure, and so on. Uh, basically, I asked myself you know, that, that question, are we just a bunch of idiots or is it a common problem that everyone would have? <laughs> um, and I went and I talked to people in the community. I, you know, I talked to people from Nordstrom, Starbucks, Netflix, and I was just asking them that basic question, hey guys, are you facing that problem um, that we're going through and going through that endless cycle of optimize and monitor and so on? And they said, well, yes, it's definitely, this is what, what is happening with us. And, and we keep juggling between different tools and different uh, you know, rules and matrix to really optimize our infrastructure. And from that point, I, you know, I asked myself and, and my co-founder, I came, you know, I came across my co-founder at that time, Omar, and we asked ourselves, can we really make this much easier than before, especially with the emergence of containers and Kubernetes? That was around the year 2015, and containers was, you know, was a was a big thing at that time, and Kubernetes was just getting started, and you know, I was asking in the community, hey guys, when are we going to get that day where we you know, um, uh, the users or the developers just, um, you know, push their containers and they do not really need to think about the VMs, the size of the VM and, or the amount of CPU and memory. Um, and I did not get the definitive answer. And from that point, we said, okay, I think this is this is a big opportunity to really push a big value to the community, um, uh, you know, by reducing the overhead, managing such, a, you know, the, the capacity and taking a look at the matrix, et cetera. Um, and that's that's basically our funding story. So I've got a I've got a question um, because I was just looking on the website uh, as you were talking, and I don't see any mention of open source. So I mean, since we are a since this is Floss Weekly, um, I think the first question I should ask is where does open source come into the picture? Uh, that's a good question. So our uh, you know our work actually composed of two parts. There's um, the, the agent part, which is the piece that sits on the user cluster, and there is the back end part that uh, helps that agent to operate properly. The agent is the open source piece. Uh, the back end is not open source yet. Um, and the agent itself, we, we open source our agent last uh, November uh, for two main, two main reasons. Number one, uh, we wanted to, you know, provide our, uh, you know, the users a transparency of, you know, this is exactly the matrix that um, the Magalix reads. Uh, th this is this is what basically need to be done for the agent to run properly, uh, and just to prove that there is no need to access any user data or customer data. We work at the system level, at the API, at the Kubernetes API level. And we had another goal in mind is gradually to make the agent work independently from our back end and give some value um, uh, to the community around capacity management inside Kubernetes. We wanted uh, Magalix agent to be just um, uh, an installable piece or an installable pod that can do the basic um, uh, capacity management for you without necessarily uh, depending on, uh, on Magalix. We said, let's open source that Make sure that everyone is familiar with it and gradually roll out that plan um, and, and, and make sure that, uh, that the agent, you know, get plugged nicely into the Kubernetes ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. Um, is the plan to open source the backend piece eventually or is that TBD? Uh, that's TBD uh, for one main reason. Uh, the, the main driver of all of that is the data itself. And the data belongs to the users and we do not want to upset and, and cross the boundary where the data you know uh, gets in, in the wrong hands so uh, we're still trying to do some engineering work in the background to make sure that we can actually expose that back end as an open source project uh, without the heavy the current heavy dependency on um, on each user data okay that's a fair answer I think um, if the agent is open source though is would there be a way for me to use the agent? Uh, to take the agent and use it with a different backend, would you be okay with that? Uh, right now, not uh, not at the moment. We're actually working to make it work with uh, with Prometheus. Hopefully, within uh, the next uh, few weeks, we're going to have a new release of our agent where it can interface with Prometheus. Right now, it inter interfaces with our backend as the main source of the matrix, uh, but over time, it's going to be 100% compatible with Prometheus. 
So oh, that's great news. And, the official and, monitoring uh, Yeah, that, that's monitoring fantastic. Channels. The um, th And that's exactly, you read my mind. That's exactly why I asked, or one of the reasons I asked is because, you know, I talk to, uh, you know, IT ops guys all the time that are living in this space and they love mm -hmm. having their open source tools, right? I mean, it's, it's actually growing uh, the open source community around containers and Kubernetes specifically um, is really, really strong. And people, people like, especially Prometheus is a great example. They want that interaction, the ability to show the data when they need it to see what's going on. So I think I, it's great that you're actually working on that integration. Um, what kind of traction are you seeing? Like, you know, how, how is, uh, how is this growing? How's this, how's the product growing? What companies are using it? Where are you seeing it implemented? Where are you seeing it having success right now? Absolutely. Uh, so right now, uh, we have uh, a SaaS freemium model. Anyone can just go to uh, magalux.com. You can register with one command line. You can install the agent. And within a few minutes, the matrix will be flowing. Within a few hours, you're going to see recommendations uh, with full analysis of your, um, of your containers and how much capacity they're using. Um, right now, most of our users are coming from small to medium-sized companies where the DevOps function is handled almost by everyone. Um, and this is where we see a lot of value being provided to, uh, to the team and to the company. Uh, you do not have a dedicated DevOps engineer, yet it's, um, it's a task or it's a duty that everyone or any, someone needs to do it, uh, which is managing the capacity of the cluster. Um, and uh, you do not really need to, uh, at that point, once you install the agent, you do not really need to babysit uh, your cluster to a large extent. Just one, uh, one quick thing to, to mention here, there are two pieces or two parts of it. There's the recommendation part and there's the execution part. Uh, you can go ahead and run uh, Magalix for free, Magalix agent for free, uh, and you can get all the recommendations that you need. Uh, but at a certain point, you can actually upgrade your account and you can turn, on, turn those recommendations into actual decisions, uh, which means that the agent will go ahead and execute those for you. And actually we have um, what's so-called the autopilot button. Once you turn this on, uh, basically, the agent is going to go ahead and, um, and and execute those recommendations for you, uh, and you can control the frequency. It can be done every hour uh, in terms of how frequently you really want your cluster to go up and down, or you can uh, reduce that and make it daily, weekly, uh, et cetera, uh, whatever that works or makes sense uh, to, you, to your team and your business. So I'm just thinking about this architecturally. So the agent sits at the cluster level, is that correct? Yep. Okay. And then you're able to, the agent is collecting data back to the back end. The back end is doing the, the ML, right? And it sounds like you're, you're kind of doing some baselining. We talk about this all the time at AppDynamics when we're monitoring applications is setting those baselines. And then based mm -hmm. on the baselines, if you're above or below the baselines, then the agent is actually, you can communicate back to the agent, have it take the action to, to add more containers or, or remove containers as the case may be. Is that an accurate hey, depiction of the architecture? Uh, Yes, it's, uh, it does two things. Uh, there's the vertical or horizontal scalability of your containers. So if you're going to do the vertical, which is basically same container, but you want to add more memory or CPU, or you want to uh, add, this is the vertical, the horizontal is to basically add more replicas to it. Uh, you can control that, and of course it depends on your architecture. At the moment, um, this is a manual process is to say, well, I want this container to be uh, for the ML to consider only vertical scalability for that container, and then the ML will take the care of the rest in terms of what, what would be the proper values, and also for the horizontal scalability uh, for some of your containers. Um, yep, and that's that's basically what, what takes place in the background. Right now, we do it by default every hour for you. So every single hour, there are going to be uh, you know, a, a, a big or comprehensive wave of scanning for your cluster and containers and workloads, and then generating recommendations. Those recommendations are for the next one or two hours. So let's say at 10 a.m., um, the agent will scan uh, all your cluster. It's sending the matrix anyways every minute. The ML will decide based on that and based on the history, oh, I, I see that there is a bottleneck that is forming in some parts of the cluster. So for the next hour, I need to allocate more memory or more CPU for that container and maybe increase the replicas of that container and so on. 
And then based on that, in 30 minutes, for example, one hour from that analysis time, those are going to be executed ahead of any, you know, anticipated changes in the workloads. Great. Uh, that's a, you're anticipating all of my questions. I love this, the horizontal vertical scaling. That was going to be the next thing I asked. So in terms of the baselining, how far out do you go? What, what, what kind of uh, time periods are you looking at? Is it, is it hour of the day, um, day of the week, you know, day of the month, day of the year, that kind of thing? Or is it, is it purely predictive into, hey, here's, you know, the, we're starting to ramp up here. So we're going to give you this recommendation, you know, based on what we project for the next, just like you said, for the next few hours. Yeah, got it. That, that's a good question. Um, and that's actually also bring the challenge of managing the scalability. When you think about managing this capacity of your cluster, typically the engineer would look at different resolutions of their matrix. They would look at the one minute, five minutes, one hour, and so on. And the reason that they're doing this is because they want to see a distinction taking place at different uh, different times. You might be You might be having daily patterns um, you know every time in the morning you might be get, getting a typical spike you might get weekly patterns maybe you know over the weekend there is a, you know, a certain spike for whatever the reason is and then we might get seasonal patterns and based on that the engineers usually or the devops would calculate how much capacity they need and you know the main reason for over provisioning in general that they calculate the maximum for all of these and they say okay i'm going to just provision the maximum that will take me through all those spikes whether they're daily or weekly etc um, what Magalix does is pretty much the same thing. Uh, it, we collect the matrix at one minute resolution. However, we downsample this one minute all the way to 12 hours. And the ML actually works at all those six resolutions. Uh, those six resolutions are basically um, allow the ML to look at the different patterns if there's something happening on a daily basis or every few hours. If there's something happening every few every few days, weeks, etc., you know, obviously, the more you run your application, or the more matrix uh, Magalix backend or the ML would have, you know, the more the more further in the future it can look, and the more it, more patterns it can capture, if you will. Uh, so that's that's basically how it works in the background at the moment. Yeah, that's great. And then, how do you extend that out? Well, first of all, let me ask another question first. Actually, in terms of events and metrics that you're collecting to make these decisions, I may have missed it earlier on when you were describing the you know overall how it works. But um, what data points are you actually taking into account? Is it only application load data points? Is it response times? Is it uh, resource? Uh, constraints in terms of CPU and memory. Uh, what what data points are you actually tracking to be able to make those recommendations? Absolutely. So right now we collect um, the basic uh, system level matrix like CPU, memory, uh, network, desk, etc., and we collect some variations of that. Uh, so for example, we collect the CPU and we collect uh, you know the CPU throttling matrix, and uh, we use them together to estimate how much CPU uh, you're going to use. Uh, this is this is the level that we're working uh, at right now. Uh, hopefully, as we you know, uh, as we move on to the next level of um, of optimization, we would like to introduce you know uh, more application level matrix. So, uh, for example, let's assume that you're exposing an HTTP endpoint, and you want to make sure that uh, there's a certain level of uh, you know a service service level of certain latency, if you will, um, to keep it uh, Ideally, the ML actually should be looking at this, and based on that, it actually um, you know decides on how much resources it needs. Uh, so right now, we're only working at the system level, but hopefully over time, as we get that uh, compatibility with, with Prometheus, we're going to start looking at the application level matrix. Okay. And then, and then uh, you may have mentioned this. I, I don't remember that. Who's using it today? Like how many customers do you have? Uh, what's your largest customer? Because I am concerned also about scale. It seems like the, from the way you described it, it should scale fairly, fairly reasonably. But, you know, how, what's your biggest, uh, if, you, if you know, I mean, sometimes you don't know, what's your biggest implementation right now in terms of, in terms of scale? Yep. So the biggest connected cluster right now <laughs> with, uh, with running with a single agent is around 900 nodes. That cluster is dynamic. It ranges from 400 to 900 nodes, depending on the workload that they're having, or you know, throughout the day. Uh, and actually, that was a challenge for us to so run um, a single agent for uh, for a cluster that big. 
uh, but we managed actually to uh, you know, fix a few bugs here and there, and actually we're, it's working fine. And we can manage uh, clusters as small as um, you know three machines. Uh, you know, from an economic perspective, you know, you want to really have something that is thin. Uh, the sweet spot is something, a cluster that is ten nodes or more. Uh, anything below that, uh, you know, the the manager, the management, the capacity management of the cluster is not really a big issue. You can still use the agent. You can still install it. Uh, but you know the sweet uh, spot, I would say, somewhere between you know 50 and 100 nodes, where it becomes a really big overhead. Few hours, uh, you know, every couple of days to uh, to make sure that your cluster is really efficient. Once you go beyond uh, 100 or 200 nodes, that's definitely um, that's a no-brainer, I would say, for for the users to use something like uh, like Magadex. So um, I wanted to jump in here for a minute or two. Um, so what is this written in? I'm guessing Go, just because everything around Kubernetes seems to be in Go. Am I, am I right? Yes. Uh, agent itself is in Go. The core pipeline is in Go. Uh, the ML, uh, though, is in Python. Okay. Well, so there's a... Two languages I don't know. <laughs> Python and Go. <laughs> but that's fine. That's perfectly fine. How, as you're designing this, you must also have, um, you, you must have some sort of uh, key value stores or database to be able to deal with the, the record. You said it was, you're recording over 12 hours uh, at one second intervals or something like that. Or maybe one minute intervals. So I might have misheard. Yep. Um, where, where is that data being stored? So right now we use a suite of uh, tools. We're definitely uh, all open source. So we use, you know, InfluxDB. We use Prometheus itself. We're mm -hmm. running on top of Kubernetes, and um, you know, you'll be uh, you'll be surprised that we're definitely using the agent to optimize the Kubernetes cluster. So everything that we have is Kubernetes using uh, Kubernetes itself. So we run the agent to optimize for itself. So the agent is running on the cluster that is hosting our back end, and we optimize for ourselves. And um, that was, you know, a core, um, I would say, a, a core rule for us, dog fooding our own stuff and making sure that we're solving the scalability issues for ourselves. Uh, just no, don't tell anyone. Sometimes we get some downtimes uh, because we're not able to keep up. <laughs> um, yeah. But... We're using InfluxDB. We're using uh, again Prometheus, all in Go language, um, and of course, uh, you know MongoDB. Um, yeah, those those are the the main technologies that we're using in our backend. And and how are you with the community? Is there is there a community outside of your company yet that uh, is contributing uh, patches and stuff to this? So so far, we get uh, sporadic kind of this, this, uh, you know contributions to our agent. We're actually trying to streamline this uh, right now. Most of the contributions that we get are in uh, in the form of bugs, uh, you know, and issues um, uh, that get fil get uh, filed against uh, the agent, and some mm -hmm. ideas around what need to be done. Uh, I think the uh, once we are 100% compatible with Prometheus, things will accelerate at that space. Right now, we're open to any issues, any bugs that get reported. Of course, anyone can contribute to the to the code base, uh, but I think it's going to be more active once we get into Prometheus, uh, you know, sphere in general. And and have you been able to contribute to the the Prometheus space in terms of uh, either bug fixes or uh, feature requests? Uh, we actually did a Kubernetes. Uh, one of the features that you know we discussed with. Um, with a few engineers uh, in Seattle is the what's so-called um, in-place vertical auto-scaling. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the key limitations right now in, in Kubernetes is the um, if you would like to vertically scale your container, uh, add more CPU memory, you will have to restart it. And that's, that's a big limitation. Some containers you really cannot, you don't really want to restart them, especially if you want to just add more CPU power to them. Uh, so that group, uh, you know, has been working on that feature, and uh, you know, we're trying to really support uh, this feature, um, you know, either with or without Magalix. Um, we are mainly focused on, on Kubernetes and how uh, Kubernetes is actually executing the capacity management in general more than mm -hmm. Prometheus. We we believe Prometheus is is way advanced in in handling matrix. And the challenge is not in how you measure and store and visualize the matrix. The challenge is how you take insights from those matrix 
and execute the recommendations in a clean way uh, on top of Kubernetes. And that's what we would like to see more contributions uh, at, either from Magalix or from others. That's an area that definitely need, uh, need more attention. And I'm sort of curious, so the uh, why is this not just something that's monitoring the load average and spinning things up as needed? What, what's, what's more complex about the problem than that? Well, two, two things. Uh, the complexity comes from, number one, setting up the pipeline. Right now, you can do that without Magalix. You can actually set up the horizontal pod autoscaler, which is, you know, an open source piece that, uh, that you can use in vertical pod autoscaler. But... Mm -hmm. But you need to set up Prometheus. You need to know, uh, have enough history of your data. You need to set mm -hmm. up the rules, the scalability rules, you know, how much, uh, you know, CPM memory should you add when you get a certain amount, a certain workload, and so on. So there is a lot that needs to be done. Uh, certainly, I see lots of engineers doing that. But the problem is, it's not, it's not a, uh, you know, uh, it's not a fire and forget uh, thing. We need to really mm -hmm. keep Keep up with this on a weekly or bi-weekly basis. And every time you need to do this, you know, to maintain your rules and scalability rules, you need to, you know, take a look at so many metrics. And what we're trying to do is just take all that overhead. There are way more important stuff that, you know, engineers want, want to do inside the clusters rather than, you know, just, just looking at, um, at matrix and just adding uh, or editing rules. Um, so the challenge is in, in how much time and the cognitive overhead that you uh, that you need to uh, to go through or have to really achieve that. You can still do it without Magalix. That's fine. Um, mm -hmm. and, I, and I see lots of teams doing it. But do you really want to spend a few hours every you know every week or you just do it in five minutes and then it, it automatically take care of that for you and you get detailed reports on you know your capacity optimization and how much you could save uh, you know for the next few weeks. Okay, and so the the uh, the, the the sort of Does pattern recognizer. So yeah, that, that that was good. So the the sort of pattern recognizer that is you know recognizing that you know at 10 a.m. we have this spike and and uh, this happens Monday through Friday. Uh, is, are there ways that the engineers, uh, the operators, can provide hints to say we know that next Friday is a holiday, so it won't have that same pattern? Uh, that's a great point. Uh, yes, we, one of our customers is in uh, is in e-commerce, and they were basically mentioning the Black Friday. Uh, they would say, mm -hmm. "Well, your ML never saw the Black Friday." Let's say I'm, I'm a customer with you for three months, and you know the Black Fridays of 2019 is not going to be like 2018. How the ML is really going to save the day for me? And mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the the short answer for this, we will like to provide a dial at the end of the day to, uh, saying, well, you know what, I'm expecting do uh, to have double the workload on my system. You know, can, can Magalix do the rest or the needful for me? So rather than going through, you know, the tens and tens of containers that you may have in your infrastructure and adjusting the, the rules for all those containers, is pretty much, um, you know, much more abstract way to say, this is what Black Friday means for me. And then the ML will take care of everything. Uh, so this is something that, you know, we've been collecting feedback from users about uh, to basically, um, you know, make it up, make it up when the ML, um, you know, uh, miss a certain event or when, when, you know, engineers or whoever is uh, running the cluster knows that what is upcoming never seen before. It's not a, it's not a typical pattern. Mm -hmm. And of course, if there's a pattern that is already taking place, but the ML is not able to capture, uh, uh, this is also another piece that we are, you know, it's upcoming in the pipeline where you can basically train it um, and pinpoint some, um, you know, basically create an, a calendar for the ML uh, telling it, hey, during that time, I know it's going to be, uh, you know, a really downtime or, or a slow time for me. Please make sure that I do not exceed, let's say, 30% of my capacity. Okay, and um, uh, now let me ask probably a couple of stupid questions because, okay, I know I, I know what Kubernetes sort of is. We're talking about containers. <laughs> We're talking about containers scaling up. Yeah, bear with yeah. me for a second. Are those containers? Uh, those are, must be Linux containers, right? And is is that using? Is it Docker that's doing that, or is it something else? 
So uh, you mean how, how, what is the workflow to expand or to add more capacity or take capacity from those containers? Is this your question? Yeah, I, I think I'm trying to ask that, but I'm trying to I'm, when I, when I, the real question I want to ask, I'll just ask that and then you can answer that real question, which is what do you need to add to the containers that are being spun up in order for Megalix to work? Is there like a Megalix agent that needs to be oh, monitoring okay. everything inside? Uh, nothing. There's no change that is needed for you know in your source code or any of your containers. We do not um, we do not actually work at um, you know inside the container. We work at the outside of the container, uh, oh, which is okay. how much resources the system is going to get to your container. Um, and this is basically what we're trying to do. And that makes us makes what we do is compatible with any programming language. Um, and you know it does not require any prior knowledge about what is inside the container. Uh, we basically just deal with it as a black box. Okay, okay, that sounds cool. Uh, and what's what's on your roadmap? What's what's what are you still missing that you want to create? I, uh, I know you want you, you were talking about open sourcing some of the back end stuff. Uh, what what else is on your roadmap coming up soon? So right now, uh, let's let's take it. Um, okay. So right now, we support major cloud providers. We support we support AWS, Azure, Google, and IBM. Uh, mm -hmm. A couple of others are uh, in the pipeline, and we would like to support on prem. We see lots of users right now. Um, according to some stat statistics, around forty percent of uh, Kubernetes users are running it on prem. And we would like to support uh, on-prem scenarios. Now, the on-prem is a bit uh, challenging because um, you know it's easy to scale up and down the container within the Kubernetes cluster. But when you try to do it at the next level, which is scaling up and down the number of the VMs or the size of the VM itself, now it depends on the framework that uh, the user is using, you know, underneath uh, Kubernetes itself. <clears throat> Uh, for the major cloud providers, it's a straightforward thing. We just use their APIs to ask for a new VM or, you know, just uh, deprovision an, an existing VM. Uh, so that's uh, one piece on the roadmap. The other one, is, uh, as I touched, uh, touched on, is the um, business level KPIs as the main driver for capacity management. Right now, we use only uh, system level, CPU, memory, etc. But what we would like to do is enable users to... Uh, to point the ML to specific matrix and say, this matrix is my key indicator and make sure that everything else will meet my goal here. Um, if I would like to have, uh, you know, uh, average latency half a second for that HTTP endpoint, just make it happen. Uh, so that's another piece. And of course, open sourcing and making sure that it's easy for others open sourcing the you know uh, more and more of our pipeline and making uh, making sure that others can run uh, you know the technology from our uh, you know current backend uh, model. It's still that particular piece is is a bit tricky uh, because as I mentioned, ML is not about the code or the model; it's about the data and the training uh, that you. Um, you know the 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 training process that you use to make sure that your models are really accurate. Uh, so we're still learning about about that. We're still learning from our own experience, and trying to over time, you know, push that to the community and make sure that the community will benefit from that without too much of an overhead that um, the user would uh, would get uh, with this uh, with this package. So I'm just taking a look at your pricing as well. I mean, and you just answered my next question, right? Which is, are you going to support on-prem? Of course. Uh, we seem to be in sync here. I don't know what's going on between uh, Petaluma <laughs> and Cairo. But um, but I did want to ask about security and whether that's a concern. Because that also plays into uh, customers who want to keep you know their infrastructure on-prem, right? Um, and it's mostly for security reasons, right? Um, uh, so I guess... You know, how do you tackle that question with customers when they say, "Like, yeah, I want to use this product, but uh, you know, we have cons we have concern about what kind of data is flowing in and out of your your controller, for example." Uh, we have we have an ex yep we have an experimental or we have an experimental model right now, which is what we call it the enterprise version of Megalix, and um, and that particular piece is basically allowing you to get the whole thing installed within your uh, data center or within your VPC. Uh, we're still experimenting with a couple of customers. 
um, where you know in that model you still install the agent, but rather than the agent sending to our uh, you know own backend, we basically install uh, a replica of Magadex on your uh, inside your infrastructure, and the agent just does the communication internally, nothing to be really pushed uh, outside your uh, your data center. So this is still uh, an experimental feature. Uh, I think it's doable, but you know there's some rough edges that we're working on. Okay. And then what about private cloud? Like what if I wanted to, and this may be the exact same answer actually, but what about, you know, Pivotal Cloud Foundry or OpenShift or, you know, platforms like that where, um, you know, they've kind of baked this into the platform. Would it work on those platforms or no? Yeah, right now we're only experimenting with OpenShift. Um, definitely the others are on the roadmap. We're just getting started with it. So we're testing the model in general. Once we make sure that the model is actually something that many customers or many users would need, we're definitely going to invest in others. Um, you know, being compatible with any uh, you know any you know, private cloud infrastructure, Azure Stack, Cloud Foundry, etc. Okay, and then the, I guess the last question for me, just to be fair to everybody else that's that's watching this, uh, who may not be familiar with the landscape, I mean, who are you competing against? I guess it seems like I, I read about a startup that's that's doing this almost every. Every day, there's a new startup that's coming out and trying to tackle this problem. I mean, who are your who are your biggest competitors in the space, and what do you do differently uh, that they don't do? Got it. Uh, so our competition comes from uh, from different areas. Definitely, the data competition is from startups who are trying to optimize for Kubernetes specifically. Um, there are some really well respected uh, companies in this, uh, like Turbonomics. Uh, cloud have uh, cloud ability. They're they're all trying to um, you know tackle the same problem. Uh, the main uh, the main differentiation I would say from us uh, between us and them is if you think of us, I would say we are the Stripe version of the cloud capacity management. Uh, most of those uh, solutions would require a heavy kind of um, Heavy or, or a complicated process to enable them and install them and, and and make sure that they're running properly inside your infrastructure. For us, if you go and register, it's just once you register, one command line, copy and paste inside your uh, console uh, or uh, you know cluster console, and then you're up and running. So that's number one. We want we wanted to make it really easy for anyone to adopt the solution. Uh, the second uh, the second distinction is how fast you get those recommendations. Most of the other companies would basically wait until they accumulate enough data uh, so that they give you recommendations based on two weeks or maybe four weeks uh, data that they collect specifically about your cluster. But one of the goals that we had in mind at the beginning is how can we really make this 10x faster? Rather than waiting for days and weeks, can we really give those recommendations in a few hours? And then over time, the model will adjust itself. And that's, uh, that's actually what we have right now. Uh, once you run that command, a few minutes, you get the, the matrix, and then in a few hours, you get the recommendations. Uh, uh, maybe those recommendations are based on the short history that we've seen, but over time, we start generating um, you know, uh, 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 some predictions or forecasts for your matrix, and then uh, give you the recommendations. And that, you know, that takes me to the third and final uh, you know, uh, distinction that I you know, would like to mention here, which is the proactive nature of uh, uh, our scalability, um, you know, decisions or recommendations. Again, rather than waiting for stuff to happen, and then we say, oh, the, your infrastructure now need to keep up with your users. We would like to uh, make sure that we're accurate as much as possible in our, you know, workloads and anticipation, and based on that, we proactively scale your infrastructure and containers. So, how, how? One more question. I know we're kind of probably running out of time here, but how do you ensure that accuracy? Right? How do you know that your algorithm and the way that you implement it is better than your competitors? I guess, and then also, how do you come back to, uh, or how do you, how do you back up these proof points on your website? You said 10x faster and 50% savings in in the cost of cloud infrastructure. So 10x faster, I'm assuming is is that a performance of your of your what of your application? Like, how do you back those numbers up? Uh, that's a good point. So. Um let, let me answer the first question first. How do we guarantee the accuracy of our models? Um, it's, it's a you know from an abstract perspective it, uh, uh, or abstract sense, it's very simple. Um, every time we generate a recommendation and, and generate an 
you know, uh, a future matrix. We measure it against the, the actual. And this is part of our secret sauce. The ML actually not only generates decisions, but also takes a feedback about what, is, uh, what it uh, predicted and the recommendations that it generated. Every time uh, is a miss, we basically accumulate this in the back end, uh, you know, in a, in a special store. And at a certain uh, point, we basically uh, fire up a retraining that is specific to that user. So we have a month worth of data that we use to train our initial models. And when you run for the first few hours, you use those basic models. And then after, you know, those recommendations are being generated and when the ML sees that, hey, there is something special about this container or that specific cluster, uh, you know, it, it basically branches itself and generate a specific model to that user and continuously, uh, you know, uh, and train itself in the background. So this is, you know, for the first question. Uh, for the second one regarding the 50% and 10x, Apologies if the 10x is not is not really clear, but what we meant by 10x is how fast you can really realize the value of um, of the savings and recommendations. Um, you know, as I mentioned, rather than waiting for two weeks to run a tool and get the result of um, you know that tool or the the optimization results of that tool, we wanted to basically make sure that the developers would be able to see it in a few hours. They can really see the value of um, of uh, of those recommendations really fast. Uh, so this is what we meant by 10x factors in terms of uh, you know value of re realization. The 50% um, is basically uh, by the reports that we provide in the dashboard. If you go to our dashboard, you know just install the agent and and go to your dashboard, you're going to see the estimated savings. Um, you know when those recommendations are are applied, and we actually transparently share all the <clears throat> excuse me we share all the um, you know, the back logic and how we uh, calculate the, the savings for the user. So 50% saving is the average case. Sometimes if you're really efficient from the beginning, there might be less than that. Uh, we've seen in some, with, when some clusters and some users, it can be up to 65%. And that's relative, of course, depending on how much you're over-provisioned um, uh, in, uh, in your cluster. Mm -hmm. So the average case is around 50%. That's why we mentioned it on the website. Now, we're almost out of time, so I uh, just got a couple more questions before we finish. Uh, am I correct at the beginning of the show when I said I met you at uh, KubeCon? Is that where I met yes, you? Yes, exactly. Yep. All right, good. I was trying to figure out where it was. I knew it was something about Kubernetes, you know, but I, did, I couldn't remember exactly where because I go to so many conferences now these days. Oh, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. We were, we were lucky. Um, we went, we basically, we became Google, uh, Google partners at that time, and Google was spon sponsoring us at KubeCon. Yeah. Uh, so we were there, and okay. you know, we met you. We were lucky enough. Cool, cool, cool. And then you interviewed me for something up there, right? There wasn't there a little video thing you did. Yes, we made. Yes, exactly. We made a funny video about Kubernetes. Um, happy to share it, and maybe um, you know, post it after that uh, with the rest of the community. Uh, it's about you know, you know, some trivia, um, you know, uh, you know, questions uh, about Kubernetes and some fun stuff, um, you know, to be shared with the community. Right, and I think I actually even brought up that it was. I thought it was KubeConf instead of a KubeConf because it just sort of looks like that. But um, I don't know. Maybe I didn't bring that up. I, I brought that up on the show a number of times, so that's probably where I keep thinking of it. Anyway, uh, so is there anything we didn't ask that you want to make sure our audience is aware of before we have to let you go? Uh, I think where you know you ask all the questions. Um, I. <laughs> I really strong, strong everyone to really give it a try, give us the feedback. We're still an early stage startup. We know that we have a lot to learn from, uh, from the community, from our users. And the main goal here is to just make sure that, you know, we're, we're giving back time to the developers and the DevOps to do the stuff that they really love to do uh, mm -hmm. on their infrastructure. Kubernetes and containers is an exciting technology. You can do a lot with it. But you can easily get dragged into, you know, mundane jobs of capacity management that can easily be automated, and that's what we're trying to do here. It sounds good. Sounds good. So, uh, uh, and also, are, are you more of a programmer type or a manager type? I'm a mix between this and that. You know, in a in a startup, you wear all the hats, right? So maybe okay. at night, I'm a developer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Morning. Okay. Then, Maybe I'm then I have manager. two more questions. I have two more questions for you. Then. Sure, so, what's sure, your sure. what's your favorite programming language? Go. Go land. 
Go. Okay, well, that's fine. And what <laughs> text editor do you spend all day in? Um, Visual Studio Code. All right, Visual Studio Code. You know, we're going to have them on the show soon. I keep getting promised that somebody from Microsoft is going to actually be on the show about the, that thing because I'm using it all day now too, which is uh, uh, which is really really amazing because I'm you know I'm an old time, very old time Emacs user. Uh, but when I started getting into Dart and Flutter, uh, Visual Studio Code with its IDE was so beautiful and so easy to use and so fast and much better than Android Studio and much better than um, uh, anything oh, yeah. else sort of in that arena. So I'm, I'm I love Visual Studio Code. It's just it's just an amazing thing that you know it's it's been it's been such an amazing turnaround, a 480 degree turnaround by Microsoft from 20 years ago from the Halloween mem uh, memo to now where they really are embracing uh, open open source and stuff. So I'm really happy about that. So I want to make sure to get them on the show really soon. So we'll get it happen. We'll get it to happen. We'll get it to happen. Anyway, uh, thank you for coming on and talking about Magalix. And um, uh, appreciate your the time you're taking out of the day to be able to do that. And uh, I'm sure more people will be downloading it right after this show and playing with it. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it, Randall. Thank you very much, Aaron, for the interesting discussion, the questions. And uh, happy to answer any questions that you may get uh, from your audience um, over you know whatever channel that you prefer. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, Aaron, what do you think? Yeah, this is good stuff. I mean, this is exactly uh, what's needed in the industry right now um, is something to automate, right? The, it's, it's this kind of the last pillar um, at App Dynamics. We talk about visibility, insight, and action, right, as the three pillars of of what we do, which is which is monitoring applications and infrastructure. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, it's really that action piece that's been lagging, and it, and it's an enabler for uh, SREs and and IT ops folks, right, so that they don't have to worry about it quite as much. Um, you still have to worry about it. Like I said, you can't completely say, well, we're just going to flip the switch and everything's just going to run, right? You still have, to, you still want your reports. You still want to look at your dashboards. You still want to ensure that the automated actions you're taking are happening. But in this case for Kubernetes, um, it really can become a big headache and uh, uh, costly as well. There was a a quote from from Gartner, uh, and this was an estimate in their uh, um, in, in their case, but they estimated something like two hundred billion dollars were at risk um, because people didn't have proper monitoring of their applications and infrastructure in the cloud. Um, so there's a huge amount of money involved across the board for making sure that that people are able to uh, keep up with those cost overruns and make sure they don't happen. Um, it can be a real game changer for a company and a competitive differentiator as well, keeping your costs under control. Cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. And this, this is definitely an um, interesting area because I know, like I said, uh, you know, ZipRecruiter is moving everything to cloud, cloud, Kubernetes all that stuff and trying to scale things separately and going to 12 factor and stuff like that. And it's funny. One of the, uh, one of the uh, meetings has a meeting notes to get sent out every week and they've listed it as zero X one, two F a, as if that's 12 factor, but that's actually a huge hex number. <laughs> so it's like <laughs> nothing to do with 12 factors anymore. And then there's also the other joke, which I really like, which is I mixed up, two-factor authentication with 12-factor apps, and now I can't log in. <laughs> I can't get online at all. Anyway, let's talk about who's coming up. Uh, nobody knew since last week, but man, what a flurry of activity in the last few, couple weeks. So it's really cool. Next week is going to be a Flexera Flex open source report. That's the uh, annual vulnerability survey by Secuni Research. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, various uh, problems with open source software. So that's pretty cool. Uh, Railroader, which is a security static analysis tool for finding vulnerabilities in applications that use Ruby on Rails. I guess a few people still use that. Um, Fluid Keys, which builds on open PGP and makes it easy to implement great security across your organization. Edisync, which is uh, secure end-to-end -end encryption and privacy regarding uh, respecting sync for your contacts, calendars, and tasks. Very cool. Mycroft, which is the world's first open source assistant. Well, they're claiming it's that. I don't know if that's actually true, but whatever. Well, we'll, we'll go with what they're saying first. So it's basically, think of um, think of like um, uh, Alexa and Siri and things like that, but all open source. So it'll run 
on almost every level of computer, like Raspberry Pis all the way up to uh, you know, like your automobile, things like that. So it should be very cool. Uh, Ionic, which is a free open source mobile UI toolkit for developing high quality cross-platform apps for native iOS, Ooh. Android, and uh, the web, which should be pretty interesting, all yeah. from a single code base. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and also as a, as a Flutter advocate, I'm definitely going to be looking forward to that show to really sort of, you know, figure out what the differences are and why, because that's JavaScript, I'm pretty sure. It's not It's not Dart. Dart's a much better language. But okay, <laughs> I said that out loud, didn't I, right? I'm allowed to say that out loud. And then uh, uh, rounding up the schedule for what we have so far, is uh, Redis uh, wanted to come on from a couple of years ago. Uh, we had him on in July 2017, but they said, well, they've changed. It's now on in-memory data structure store, uses database, cache, message broker, supports data structures such as strings, hashes, lists, sets, sorted sets with range queries, bitmaps. So basically, data. It's a, it's a very, very quick data uh, in-memory in thing. Um, again, go to the uh, homepage for this show, twit.tv slash floss, in order to figure out who we've got coming up and what their schedule actually is. Again, if you have any other suggestions, please tell the project leader or the community coordinator to email me. And uh, my email is right there on that page, merlin at stonehenge.com. Um, we have a live stream at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time on Wednesdays at live.twit.tv. I'm not sure if we took any questions this week, but I uh, can't remember. Yeah. Anyway, you can follow us at, at Floss Weekly on Twitter. You can follow me at, at Merlin, M E R L Y N, on Twitter. Uh, I will be tomorrow through the end of the week. Uh, I'm going to be at scale uh, in Pasadena. So if you're in the uh, Pasadena area, please come by. Uh, I have a uh, boff uh, tomorrow night on uh, um, uh, Dart and Flutter. So please come by that if you want. Uh, and uh, I deliberately scheduled that so it's not the same time as any of their parties and things like that so uh, it should be pretty easy just to drop by i don't actually have any speaking roles this this year i would usually speak at scale but hey, I, you know, I missed the deadline it was this went whoosh right by me and i went oh i didn't i didn't actually submit anything to the cfb so i'm just being there as press i'm representing floss weekly there and trying to look for some more guests for floss weekly that's always my goal when i go to a conference so um, anything you want to plug there aaron uh, yeah, so if we're going to, well, first of all, everyone should go to Scale. Love Scale. Um, it's a great conference. I wish I could go back. I haven't been there in a long time. So at some mm -hmm. point, maybe next year, you and I can can get together and do something at Scale. Um, cool. Maybe a panel or something like that. That would be fine. Um, uh, but speaking of conferences, uh, we have our own conference. Benicia Makerspace puts on a conference. Uh, it's not really a conference. It's an event uh, every year in the spring. And we just renamed it. It's called the Steam Discovery Festival this year. So if you go to steamdiscoveryfestival.com, you can find out more about it. If you're anywhere in the Bay Area... Um, and you want to participate, of course, you can attend the event, right? But you can also actually either uh, sponsor the event if you work for a company that loves to sponsor hands-on learning, uh, you know, technology-related events for the community. We would love that. You can volunteer um, or you can exhibit. If you if you have a project that you like to show off or something that would uh, you think people would be interested in, or even if you don't think people would be interested, I guarantee you they will be, uh, you know, go to steamdiscoveryfestival.com and sign up. It's April 27th. Uh, from 10 to 4. Um, and uh, if you're an exhibitor, if you're like an individual, you know, you just want to show off your project, there's no cost to exhibit. So uh, definitely go there and check it out. Cool, cool, cool. And Aaron, thanks once again for stepping up to the big microphone, especially the, the, the really nice microphone at... Uh at uh, the headquarters there, so that's I pretty know. cool. I'm so spoiled. I get the nice, comfy chair. I don't have to worry yep. about Slack problems, uh, yep. you know. And John can come over and like tell me to, you know, fix my thing every. I don't have to worry about that. So yeah, mm -hmm. I'm very spoiled mm -hmm. today to be in the studio. Yeah, and hopefully my uh, my Wi-Fi didn't drop out too many times during the show, but uh, I'm, I'm sort of limited to the five megabit up and down that the hotel provides. So kind of that's the way it is for the day. So Aaron, thanks once again, and we'll see you all again next week at Floss Weekly.